Welcome to today's LACNETS meeting. We're at Cedar sinai in LA. I'm Lindsay, I'm the Director of Communications for LACNETS, and this is? Hi, I'm Lisa, I'm the Program Director. Thank you so much to Cedar sinai for hosting today's important meeting. We have a great program for you. I'm gonna pass it off to Lisa to introduce today's speaker. I'm excited to introduce to you Megan Laszlo. She's a registered dietitian here at Cedars um, and a board certified specialist in oncology nutrition at Cedars Sinai Samuel Ashen Cancer Center. As an outpatient dietitian, she provides medical nutrition therapy to patients through nutritional counseling, education, and coordination of care. Megan is fascinated by the nutritional aspects of gastrointestinal, neuroendocrine, and head and neck cancers and is dedicated to helping patients meet their individualized goal. So as some of you know, she was one of our lunchtime breakout uh, session leaders, discussion leaders for the June conference, and many of the patients have been meeting with her, and we've heard amazing things. Um, she has a lot to share with us, and we're excited to have her here today. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and also for the invitation to speak with LACNETS. It's always a pleasure to work with this organization. They're very well organized and filled with very kind, warm-hearted people. So thank you for that. Um, in addition to um, being a dietitian here in the outpatient clinic at Cedars, I work um, within the patient and family support program. So we have a team of social workers, dietitians, rehab and physical medicine doctors, um, supportive care medicine physicians and psychiatrists, as well as a chaplain. And all these services are available to our patients. So I just want to let you make sure that you're aware of that. And then we also have several survivorship programs that promote mental and physical wellness. Uh, most of them are available for outside patients as well if there's space. And then we also have an exercise recovery program that is just for Cedars patients. And I also teach a nutrition cooking class as well. If anyone's interested in that, we have flyers at the back of the room. Let's see. So for our topics today, I want to talk about nutrition recommendations for nets without symptoms and really distinguish between nutrition recommendations for those that are experiencing symptoms of the disease or side effects from treatment versus those that are not experiencing any symptoms. I want to talk about diet and carcinoid syndrome as well as nutrition therapy for diarrhea, which is a low fiber diet, um, and also talk about different dietary supplements, micronutrient supplements, as well as oral nutrition drinks that may be helpful for you. Yeah, so the best diet for someone with a neuroendocrine tumor really depends on what kind of um, symptoms they're experiencing, how it's affecting their body, how it's affecting their metabolism, um, their glucose control, and it really takes individualized nutrition counseling. So I'll be giving some broad recommendations, but I do encourage you to meet with a dietitian. Um, either ask your oncologist for a referral, or if you need to, ask your primary medical doctor for a referral. Um, and I'm happy to meet with anyone that's um, being seen here at Cedars. So just to go over some general healthful dietary recommendations, um, this is a set of 10 cancer prevention recommendations put forth by the American Institute for Cancer Research. So these not only apply for cancer prevention, but they're just healthful dietary recommendations even after a diagnosis. Um, just to really highlight, I wanna um, focus on a plant-based diet and what that means. That term gets used interchangeably with a vegan diet quite often. And that's not what we're talking about. A plant-based diet is a diet that's centered on eating plant-based foods, but can include animal proteins. So if you look at your plate, as an example for what your diet is, a third of your plate can be animal proteins, and two thirds should be plant-based foods, ideally. But we'll talk about how to modify that depending on if you need more or less fiber. Um, and then I also want to emphasize um, not taking dietary supplements to prevent cancer and really focusing on which dietary supplements are healthful for you, which ones serve you versus um, ones that can cause drug nutrient interactions or drug drug interactions. Um, 
So in general, most individuals with a cancer diagnosis need more protein. So I just want to talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, we need more protein during wound healing, after surgery, um, for muscle building, and as we get older, we need more protein as well. So it's important to get enough. Um, the amount that you need is individualized based on your current situation. If you just had surgery, you'll need more protein during that time. If you're doing an exercise regimen where you're weightlifting, you'll need more protein during that time as well. So it is individualized. Um, one way to think about this is to look at the complete ver proteins versus the incomplete proteins. Complete proteins provide all the essential amino acids, um, and incomplete proteins don't, and you should get a variety of them. With the incomplete proteins, you generally need larger volumes to get enough protein in your diet. So one way to look at this is to think about including a source of protein every time you eat. We need protein throughout the day, and so if you eat one high-protein meal, at, let's say at lunch, you're probably not getting enough. So just be conscious of that every time you eat. What's your source of protein? Uh, if it's an animal-based protein, it should be bigger than the size of a deck of cards. That's going to be a higher quality protein and give you the amount that you need um, to help sustain your immune system, to help maintain muscle mass and physical strength, and to help recover from treatment as well. You know, other sources of protein could be a cup of beans or lentils. Um, soybeans are very concentrated in protein, so you need less. Two or three eggs. I know a lot of people, they eat one egg for breakfast and think that's a high-protein meal, but you generally need more than that. Um, and then, if needed, whey protein powder can be used as a way to enhance the protein content of a smoothie or make a protein shake for yourself. I typically recommend the 100% whey protein isolate, and that means that it's lactose-free if you find that lactose is a problem for you. Um, so most people don't get enough fruits and vegetables in their diet. You know, the general recommendation is to try to aim for five a day, but there's been research that shows that eating more than that can be very helpful in um, preventing heart disease and reducing cancer risk. So it's just something to think about. Um, a serving is usually about a cup. Um, it's usually a half a cup of cooked greens. Um, so think about trying to get five servings a day. And if you're not getting that, how could you increase your fruit and vegetable intake? So I want to talk also about carcinoid syndrome. Um, carcinoid syndrome is a condition that occurs with serotonin producing cancers. Um, it's usually diagnosed with a 5-HIAA test, either the serum test or the urine test. Um, the signs and symptoms include flushing, diarrhea, rapid heart rate, um, and there's usually um, the five triggers that we know. So eating, alcohol, exercise, stress, and epinephrine can all trigger carcinoid syndrome. So I do want to talk about the different dietary patterns and foods that can be triggers for carcinoid syndrome. Um, most typically, it's eating a large meal. This is the most common food-based trigger for carcinoid syndrome. When we eat a large meal, a large meal, it starts a cascade of um, reactions in the body that trigger hormones and digestive enzymes and help to process the food that we eat. And so that's one of the most common triggers. Tomatoes are also a trigger. Alcohol, spicy or fatty foods, and eating raw vegetables can all be triggers for some people. Um, and then in addition to that, foods that contain amines as well. Um, and if you are dealing with carcinoid syndrome and want to help identify what are your triggers, I suggest number one, keeping a food diary that outlines what you're eating, how much you ate, and then what your symptoms are to help you identify if there's a correlation between your symptoms and what you've been eating. Because these are very individualized triggers. Not everyone is gonna be bothered by tomatoes, for example. You know, so I think it's really important to find out what is triggering for you and not just what the general triggers are. Um, you know, so, what I usually suggest is to work on numbers one through five first and then address number six, because when we get into the foods that contain amines, it gets to be very, very restrictive. So as an alternat alternative to eating three large meals per day, try to think about eating four to six smaller meals. You know, break it up, eat smaller meals throughout the day and see if that helps you manage your symptoms. An alternative to tomatoes could be eating bell peppers, pesto, or even beets. 
Uh, alternatives to alcohol, thinking about having herbal teas, maybe mocktails, things like that, alternative beverages. Um, of course, as an alternative to spicy foods or high fat foods, look for low fat, mild spice, cooked vegetables, and then amines just as needed. Again, if you start eliminating foods with amines, your diet becomes very restrictive, so I would start working on these other issues first. So what are amines? This is a very non-intuitive um, component in food. Amines are naturally occurring components. They're developed by protein breakdown. So when you think about amines, think about foods that have been processed, preserved. Um, they're usually found in like aged cheeses, fermented um, food products like kombucha or certain alcohols. Um, it could also be in foods that have been preserved by smoking, salting, or curing. So our, our preserved meats. Um, and then they're also found in some fruits and vegetables and nuts. So I want to review the foods with high amine content versus foods with low amine content. And so it makes good sense to try to eliminate some of these higher amine foods, especially if you identify a correlation between your symptoms and what you've been eating. So some of the higher amine foods are going to be our aged cheeses, like blue cheese, Swiss, Gouda, and so forth. So as an alternative, you could try fresh cheeses so that you can have some of these other um, cheese-containing foods. So things like ricotta, cottage cheese, mozzarella are going to be low amine compared to our aged cheeses. Um, foods that have been fermented and preserved, so our sm um, sm salted, smoked, pickled, um, and cured meats, um, smoked fish, uh, sauerkraut, kimchi, you know, foods that have been f fermented and preserved, shrimp paste, miso, um, and foods that contain yeast ex extract or brewer's yeast. So as an alternative, think about getting freshly prepared meats, fruits, vegetables, and other types of produce. Our foods with moderate amines, so these are going to have lower amounts in our aged cheeses and other preserved foods, but it does include a lot of very common foods and foods that many people will eat if they have diarrhea, for example, bananas, right? Um, so keep a lookout for these. If you identify that you think they might be triggering, avoid them and see if you feel better. But it's quite extensive, and then I listed some alternatives up there as well. And then I wanted to address high serotonin containing foods. So if you have a serotonin producing cancer, it doesn't mean that you have to avoid serotonin containing foods. It's not gonna fuel cancer growth, um, but it will, however, interfere with a 5-HIAA urine test. These don't interfere with the blood test, just the urine test. So if you have to take that test for um, three days prior to the test and during urine collection, you should avoid these serotonin rich foods. But other than that, you don't need to avoid them. There are many, many different causes of diarrhea for someone that has a neuroendocrine tumor. They can be caused by so many different reasons. Um, carcinoid syndrome for one, even treatment with semanostatin analogs such as octreotide or lanreotide can cause diarrhea. It can also be from cancer treatment, whether it's chemotherapy, um, certain medications can contribute to it as well. Um, surgery, uh, if the gallbladder's just been removed, some people will struggle with diarrhea right after surgery. Um, if the entire ileum has been removed or if the ileal sequel vowel has been removed, it's very common to have what's called bile acid diarrhea, so it's a different type. Um, short bowel syndrome, so if someone's anatomy has been altered and a lot of the small bowel has been removed. Short bowel syndrome is an issue where there's a lot of malabsorption present, and that condition really needs to be treated with the help of a gastroenterologist and a dietitian to help manage it. Um, lactose intolerance, infection, and fat malabsorption are other common causes of diarrhea. So I wanted to share this slide. This is a, um, a decision tree proposed by authors um, that have a study published in the International Journal of Gastroenterology. And so this kind of outlines different causes of diarrhea and what the proposed treatments are, because it's important to treat the cause, not just the symptom, right? So for someone with carcinoid syndrome, you know, Optimizing use of semanostatin analogs is important. And I'm sorry, there's a lot of shorthand on this slide, but 
if someone's had previous surgery, as I mentioned earlier, an ileal resection may benefit from bile acid, bi or bile acid binding resins, such as cholestyramine or Questrin. If someone had a small bowel resection, then um, considering if they have sm uh, short bowel syndrome and then treating that, Another common issue that can happen after a small bowel resection or other gastrointestinal surgery is a condition called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. And this is an issue where certain uh, strains of bacteria overgrow in the gut and there's dysbiosis among the bacteria living in the intestine. And when this happens, it can present with the same signs and symptoms as fat malabsorption. You can have oily stools, you can have a lot of gas, bloating, and uncontrolled diarrhea. Um, the way that this is tested is with a hydrogen breath test. So a gastroenterologist will conduct this test and determine if there's overgrowth in the intestine. If there is, they'll prescribe broad spectrum antibiotics to treat it. Okay, so that's another um, potential cause of diarrhea. In addition to that, pancreas resection can result in malabsorption, and also treatment with octuriotide or lanreotide can also result in fat malabsorption. Um, fat malabsorption is treated with um, pancreatic enzyme replacement drugs, and so these can help you digest the fat that you eat. So some of the signs and symptoms specific to fat malabsorption are gas, bloating, um, someone can have oily, um, yellow or orange stools, and then also weight loss despite eating enough. So you might be eating a lot, but if your body's not able to absorb it, then you're not gonna get the calories that you need to maintain your weight. And so what happens is you may be eating fat, but it may be literally going straight through you undigested. Uh, there, the treatment for this is to take um, prescription enzymes. I would suggest using prescription enzymes over over-the-counter enzymes, um, which are in much smaller doses and are not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, so we normally prescribe Creon, Zenpep, PERTC, pancreas, or other enzymes. Um, the way that these work is you take them when you eat, and they... Um, release in your small bowel and then they digest the fat that you're eating. So you wanna take them when you eat. And if you, for instance, eat something that doesn't have any fat in it, you don't need to take them. You only take it to help you digest the fat that you eat. Um, so that's a common misconception. And sometimes I see physicians um, prescribe these in really low doses. Most people need at least 24,000 lipase units per snack, and sometimes more than that. So if you're eating small frequent meals, you probably need at least 24,000 lipase units um, per small meal or snack, depending on what you're eating. And if you're eating higher fat foods, you need more enzymes. So the dose is really individualized and it may need to be adjusted. You may need to go up on your dose if you find that you're not getting results. So let's talk about the low fiber diet. Uh, this is a diet that is nutrition therapy to help manage diarrhea. Again, it, this is really an adjunct to medical treatment. It's not a substitute for medication, but it can be very helpful. Um, one way to think about this is there's two different types of dietary fiber. If you look on a nutrition label, you'll see dietary fiber in a gram amount. Um, that includes both soluble and insoluble fiber. So the difference is soluble fiber is binding. It's what's in the inside of an apple or the inside of a potato. It's binding, and if you're having diarrhea, that's the type of fiber that you want. Insoluble fiber is usually found in things like whole grains. It's the bran or the outside of the grain, or it's also in the skin of the apple or the skin of the potato. And that type of fiber draws water into the bowel. And if you are suffering from diarrhea, that's not the type of fiber that you want. So that's how we end up at a lower fiber diet. Um, so some examples are things like white rice, which would have the bran of the rice removed. So it's more digestible, more binding. Um, peeled potatoes would be another example. Um, polenta, risotto, breads, crackers, refined grains would be ideal in this situation. It's also important to stay adequately hydrated, and I usually suggest diluted fruit or vegetable juices, um, particularly for the fruit juices because concentrated sweets can be irritating for someone with diarrhea. So usually half juice, half water is a good way to hydrate, as well as broth and sports drinks and um, 
things like lemon water. You can certainly make your own rehydration drink. Um, different protein sources would be lean cuts of meat, like lean beef, pork, uh, fish, chicken, eggs, low-fat dairy. And then for vegetables, you can have vegetables on a low fiber diet, you know, so don't feel like you need to exclude all vegetables out. You can have things like cooked green beans, cooked carrots, um, zucchini without the skin, and other starchy vegetables like turnips, beets, parsnips. These are all healthful foods that you can include in your diet. Um, fruits, usually you want things like applesauce because applesauce contains pectin, which is a certain type of soluble fiber, which is binding. So it can be very helpful. Um, bananas, if you tolerate bananas, bananas can be helpful too. Not everybody that has carcinoid syndrome has to avoid bananas, so think about that. Um, cantaloupe, honeydew, most of the fruits that you remove the skin are gonna be better tolerated. Um, and then for flavor, we have to flavor our foods to make them appealing and taste good. So things like lemon juice, lime juice, herbs, ginger, um, and spices like turmeric can certainly be used on this diet as well. Um, I wanted to just touch on a, a few low-fat protein choices. So when we talk about lean proteins or lowering fat or having small, low-fat meals, you know, what does that look like? So for certain cuts of meat, um, I would try to aim for less than five grams of fat per three ounces. So three ounces is about the size of a deck of cards. Um, so think about things like eye of round, top round beef, those are gonna be some of the leaner cuts. Pork tenderloin is gonna be lean. Chicken breast without the skin is gonna be the leaner cut of chicken. Um, and think about having white fish, shrimp, or other seafood because it's all gonna be really low in fat but provide high protein. And then in terms of low-fat cooking methods, think about baking, poaching, steaming, um, broiling as good alternatives too. And there's a great cookbook in the back by Rebecca Katz. And um, there's two actually. There's, there's one for neuroendocrine tumors and then there's one for carcinoid syndrome. So they have some really great recipes in there as well. She's a great cookbook author. Um, so for those that need to follow a low fiber diet, there are certain foods that you should avoid. Um, so our whole grains, beans can be problematic. They have both types of fiber in them. They can be very fermentable, so they may cause distress. Um, fruit and vegetable skins, the raw vegetables, generally when our vegetables cooked. Um, lactose can be very problematic. If you've been dealing with diarrhea, you, most people that have had um, diarrhea for per long periods of time, just develop a lactose intolerance. It's very common, and you may just need to cut lactose out of your diet by choosing lactose-free milk or non-dairy alternatives. Um, the dairy-containing food with the most lactose is milk, but usually it gets lower in things like yogurt. Yogurt is mostly lactose-free, and so is kefir. So those probiotic-containing foods, if they don't bother you, can be, can be good sources of protein and can be lactose-free. Um, spicy foods can also be problematic, as well as high sugar foods. So yes, fruit juice can present issues, as I mentioned before, but also things like cakes, candy, um, desserts, and other sweets can tend to draw water into the bowel and maybe something that you need to avoid. Um, and alcohol as well. So just to touch on a, a few different nutrition supplements um, that are available, there are different soluble fiber um, powders as well as wafers. Um, me personally, I would choose a wafer. It's almost like eating a cookie. you know. So that can be a way to get some more soluble fiber in your diet and help control your symptoms. Um, there's different brands out there. And what I would suggest is if you are using enzymes like Creon or Pertzi, that you take any soluble fiber supplement separately from the enzymes because they can interfere um, with the enzymes. So maybe think about taking a soluble fiber supplement at night, before bed, or first thing in the morning so that it doesn't f interfere with the enzyme function. Um, Certain dietary, dietary supplements can actually cause diarrhea, so magnesium is one of those, high-dose vitamin C supplements. Um, I know some people like to take emergency and, and vitamin C supplements like that frequently. I would try to avoid those if, if that's a symptom that you're dealing with. Um, and then I usually recommend um, zinc for 10 days, especially if someone's had persistent uncontrolled diarrhea. It's very common to develop a zinc deficiency. Um, the way to correct a deficiency is to just take it for 10 days and then stop. Um, our, our lab markers for zinc aren't always that accurate. So 
it's safe and I think acceptable to just take the supplement for 10 days and then stop and not have to wait for someone to check your labs when they're not even that reliable in the first place. Let's see. Uh, so also I want to touch on niacin. So for patients with serotonin producing tumors, um, you tend to be at risk for niacin deficiency. Uh, so in the body, increased serotonin production um, causes a reduction in tryptophan and niacin. So the, all of the tryptophan gets used up to make serotonin and not niacin. And so niacin deficiency can present as diarrhea, dermatitis, and depression. Um, so for those that have serotonin producing tumors, it's safe and healthful to take a very low dose niacin supplement. So low dose means 25 to 50 milligrams. So look for that. You wouldn't wanna take a high dose niacin supplement because that can actually cause flushing. Um, so look for the low dose. Um, you don't have to take it with food, um, but I would suggest that. Um, and you can also look for no flush niacin supplements as well. If you find that you take a low dose and you still flush from it, you can look for a no flush um, version of that. Uh, just to highlight some high niacin containing foods um, as well, just to regularly include in the diet, ready to eat cereals, chicken, tuna are gonna be some of our highest and even white rice has some niacin in it as well. Uh, so I wanna talk about omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, these include EPA and DHA. They're two different type of omega-3s that are found in cold water fish. Um, so taking supplemental fish oil may reduce inflammation in the body. Um, it may help promote weight gain. Um, there is some research to show that for those um, with a cancer diagnosis that are losing weight and losing muscle mass, that fish oil may actually help attenuate some of those losses by reducing inflammation in the body. Um, there's some research to show that it can also improve performance status um, and it may improve appetite by reducing inflammation. Um, the optimal dose isn't quite known yet, but a lot of the research shows that getting more than two grams of EPA, which is one of the omega-3 fatty acids, is likely healthful, um, especially if you're struggling with weight loss. Um, there's a brand that I like called Nordic Naturals. Um, what I like about them is that they do um, third-party testing for purity, uh, and they do have a very high EPA version called Ultimate Omega. Um, but it's not the only brand. There's certain other brands out there. Um, with fish oil, tolerability can sometimes be an issue. I recommend taking fish oil with food. And then considering finding a flavored version so that you don't have regurgitation or what's called fish burps with it. Um, and then purity can sometimes be an issue because of lack of FDA oversight and regulation of all dietary supplements. So I usually look for third-party testing. There's other organizations' seal of approval on a dietary supplement when selecting something like that. You know, and there's also a benefit to eating fish as well. So think about eating fatty fish in the diet if that's something that your body tolerates. Um, so for those that are struggling with weight gain, maintaining a healthy body weight, um, some different ideas are to make your own smoothie. That way you can control whatever is in it. You can use protein powder. You can um, put different fruits in it. If you tolerate nut butters, that can be a great way to add extra calories. Uh, usually when I recommend a smoothie as a meal replacement, I suggest trying to get some kind of fat in it, some source of fat, whether it's avocado or almond butter or coconut milk, you know, just depending on what your body is tolerating, so that you can that way you can bulk it up and make it a high calorie choice. There are many different types of nutrition drinks out there. Um, some of the highest calorie ones are Ensure and Live. It's 350 calories and 20 grams of protein for eight ounces. Um, the highest calorie one that I've seen is called Boost Very High Calorie. It's 530 calories for eight ounces. So it can be really helpful for weight gain. It is high in fat though. So if you are on enzymes, you would have to take enzymes with it. Um, and then a new product that I just saw um, that's not quite yet in stores, but currently available online is called Boost Soothe. Um, so this is an all natural product put forth by Nestle. Um, it doesn't have any vitamins or minerals in it, but uh, it's not super sweet like a lot of the other nutrition drinks. It's 300 calories, I think it has 10 grams of protein, and it can be just a way to add extra calories. It's a very small size too, it's eight ounces.
So that could be something to consider, especially if you don't like the sweet taste of these other drinks. It actually has kind of a dry aftertaste. It's just different. Um, protein fortified juices could be another option. And then for anyone struggling um, with weight gain that may be also be dealing with fat malabsorption or short bowel syndrome, um, medium chain triglyceride oil can be helpful for that. So what, um, it's also called MCT. So medium chain triglycerides are a special type of fat that don't need um, pancreatic enzymes to be digested or absorbed. They're just absorbed directly into the small bowel. Um, so that can be a way to add extra calories specifically. It doesn't take away the need for using um, supplemental enzymes. Um, and uh, it doesn't provide essential fatty acids, so you still need to eat other sources of fat, but I would usually suggest uh, trying three tablespoons a day, spread throughout the day, and just see how your body tolerates it, and that could be the opportunity to get an extra 300 calories throughout the day if you're struggling with keeping your weight. Um, they sell MCT oil in a lot of the health food stores um, and online as well, so that could be something to experiment with. I think we can move on to questions. Yes. I was just curious sure. about, about the vitamin E. <clears throat> what form? Can you take it as a supplement in a capsule form? Would that be uh, successful as well? Uh, you can take vitamin E uh, in a supplemental form, or in a capsule, yeah. Um, there's no issues with that. I mean, sometimes, uh, especially if you have fat malabsorption, you can develop deficiencies in fat-soluble vitamins. E is one of those vitamins, but it's not that common. Um, another way to get vitamin E is to have healthy fats in the diet and eat dark leafy greens, too. There's a question that came in online. Um, so for a patient who has NET and is already on Creon and um, lanreotide, of course, and omeprazole for digestion, um, who's suffering from leg cramps, um, on gabapentin, they're wondering about nutritional supplements. They're already taking magnesium, calcium, and zinc in a combo pill. So the first question is, how much would you recommend? And secondly, are there any other alternatives, um, supplements, or anything cramps. that might be good, helpful? I mean, I think it's it's okay to experiment with the magnesium supplements and see, you know, a how that's tolerated, if that causes diarrhea or not, and see if it gives you any relief. Um, and also stay hydrated. You know, that can also lead to cramps as well from dehydration, you know, making sure that you're having potassium containing rehydration drinks. Um, so let me see, it could be something like tomato juice if that's well tolerated, coconut water if that's well tolerated, or something like Pedialyte even as a way to get enough potassium too. So I work with patients who have carcinoid syndrome diarrhea, and yeah. one of the things that we really struggle with is trying to come up with a food plan when they have um, diabetes. So what suggestions do you make for diabetic patients on how to manage their blood sugars while you know eating white rice to try to stem the flow? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question, thank you. That's a big, big struggle because a lot of the re nutrition recommendations um, interfere with each other. So I think first and foremost, focusing on the lean protein sources and the non-carbohydrate containing protein sources like chicken, meat, fish, um, and making that um, a big part of the diet and a big part of the plate, um, just to make sure that protein needs are met and that can help meet calorie needs. Um, I think it's important to note that the serving size for rice for a diabetic carbohydrate counting is a third cup, which is very small anyone knows household measurements. Um, so really limiting the, the rice content and then um, incorporating fats as much as possible. You know, so having healthy fat choices, using peanut butter, using avocado, if that's well tolerated, um, as a way to better meet calorie needs. And then consider even using a diabetic um, nutrition drink as well. There's one I like, um, it's a ve It's called v Orgain, and they have a vegan version that's that's low sugar, and it's all natural, and it, it tastes quite good too. So that could be another option, and you know, compared to the other diabetic nutrition drinks like Glucerna and Boost Glucose Control. Uh, my question is, if someone comes to you, maybe not necessarily carcinoid syndrome, but with issues, yeah, um, uh, from a Whipple procedure and being on Creon. How would you go about analyzing their situation, or what would be the step-by-step -step process you would work with them with? 
Uh, well, first I'd look at what type of Whipple they had, whether or not they still have a pyloric valve or not, um, and just how they're digesting things. Um, I think it's very common after a Whipple to not only have fat malabsorption, but also get full quickly and to have difficulty with eating. Um, and I would try to focus always on the protein, the use of the enzymes, how they're being taken, are enough being taken, are they being taken at the right times? Um, because sometimes you need to take enzymes at the start of the meal and then throughout the meal as well to help ba better manage malabsorption. Um, I would look at the diet too, how much fiber is being eaten, you know, what are the issues, is the issue bloating, is it diarrhea, and just really address things one by one in that way. And then if issues are persistent and the maximum dose of Creon is being used and it's not being effective, I would still consider um, looking at getting tested for SIBO as well, a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and see if that's an issue too, because I think that's, that's more common than um, we've been realizing. Number one, how do you know if Creon's not working for malabsorption? Great. And then number two, uh, what alternatives are there? Okay. Um, well, so Creon is usually prescribed when someone is having symptoms. So if someone's having oily bowel movements, they're having persistent gas and bloating, um, they're having diarrhea, and especially if um, they're noting the changes of color in their stool or oil in the toilet bowl. That's how, I mean, we really go by signs and symptoms because the, um, the pancreatic fecal elastase test isn't that valid for nuts. It's more valid for pancreatic cancer. You know, so we do use it sometimes, but we usually go by signs and symptoms. And so the first approach is to have someone take it and the prescribed amount set by their physician and to monitor their body to see if they're still having these signs after they start taking it. And then when I meet with them, ideally a couple weeks later, are you taking enough? How are you taking it? Are you remembering to take it? Are the questions that I typically ask, are you carrying it with you everywhere you go in case someone offers you food so that you have your enzyme there so that you can fully digest and absorb what you've eaten? And then if they're still having symptoms and taking Creon, maybe they're not taking enough. You know, maybe we need to double the dose and then monitor from that point, you know. And then I also usually ask if they're taking anything that could interfere with the effectiveness of Creon. So if someone's taking supplemental fiber, that can interfere, as well as things uh, like calcium or magnesium containing antacids like Tums or Maalox, that can interfere with the effectiveness of Creon too, or, or other enzymes. So that's, that's my approach. And then if they're still having signs and symptoms, you know, maybe we need to go up higher and just continue to assess and, and reevaluate. And if it's still not working, again, my approach would be to consider SIBO if we've maximized the dosage, ruled out any interfering um, practices, and someone's taking it um, the way that they're supposed to. So follow up on that. Uh, yeah. Understanding you're not a prescriber, but just yes. from what you've yeah. seen, um, what is kind of the range for Creon? Uh, a, a, quote unquote, normal starting dose and the range of doses that people are on. Oh, I see people in all kinds of doses, you know, and sometimes I have patients that come in, not necessarily nuts, but um, others with fat malabsorption that come in on 6,000 lipase units per meal, which is really a children's dose. You know, so it's very common for people to get under prescribed. Um, and I also see sometimes on the prescription, take three times daily. And so the person receives the prescription and they, they take it three times a day, not knowing that they need to take it when they eat. Um, that said, you know, here we typically start patients on a 24 to 36,000 lipase units, two with meals and one with snacks, and then go up from there. Um, that said, you know, I have had some patients on much higher doses, around 100,000 lipase units with meals too. So it can, you know, and there can be a range and it really depends on what you're eating. Is this person on a high fat diet or are they not eating any, hardly any fat at all? Because we really base it on fat intake, you know, so allowing for skipping the Creon if you're eating fat free foods like a piece of fruit or a non fat yogurt, it's okay to skip it. Thank you. Um, do you have any resources for ongoing like nutritional advice in the community um, for somebody like? like to speak to somebody like you who has like expertise in this, uh, in nutrition and this diagnosis? I would, I mean, I would ask that of LACNETS to see what resources are available outside of, of what we provide here at Cedars. I'm not sure, you know, I think that 
these organizations are so helpful for that and, and connecting to resources and also having these videos online so that people can watch and learn more and look for other websites. Um, but for one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling, I'm not, um, I'm not familiar personally with any other dietitians in the LA area. Not to say that there aren't any, but I think that's a good question for, for Lindsay and Lisa and Giovanna. I think generally we're not that familiar as well with net nutritionists that will meet one-on-one. -on -one. So that's why yeah. we're trying to provide general information from you know these videos. And, um, and then of course you could come, if you're a Cedars patient um, or you have a referral for a second opinion, you could ask for a referral to see Megan and meet with her one-on-one. -on -one. Correct, yes. Her cards are in the back too. Yes, and I actually, you know, if you're a patient of Dr. Hennifer, you've had a second opinion with him, um, you don't need a physician's referral. You can self-referral. You can just call me, and I'll do my own scheduling. What if um, you forget to take your crayon? You've already eaten. Is there anything that you can do? Oh, <laughs> I think it depends on when you remember. <laughs> I mean, generally... It takes a stomach or maybe three hours to empty, so it may not hurt you to take it afterwards. We usually want you to take it at the start of the meal uh, for maximum effectiveness, but if you forget, it, I don't think it, it doesn't harm you to take it afterwards. You can't overdose on Creon then. I think there, maybe you said that. There is a maximum dose um, that is recommended by most of the brands, and so everyone has a maximum dose based on their body weight. So you don't want to exceed that amount. So you can overdo it, but for most people, it's a lot. And what it's are a the lot. symptoms if you overdo it? There's no signs or symptoms. It just puts you at risk for um, an intestinal condition um, where you can have some fibrosis in the intestinal bowel or a hole in the bowel. Yeah, um, it's not very common. It's very, very rare that there's been any cases of that. However, all of the brands um, say not to exceed a certain amount per body weight. Yeah, so you can overdo it, but for most people it's so many that it you, you likely wouldn't if you're taking it appropriately, yeah. I know Dr. Hendifer spoke to Creon a year ago, um, but it's been a while. So with the holidays coming up, can you speak to what to do yeah. maybe in preparation for those large meals, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Passover, you know, all these yeah. holidays where you maybe have a large meal. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's important to take Creon right before you start eating, right before the first bite. Take it then, you know, and depending on what your dose is, let's say you take you usually take four with meals. Maybe take two at the start and two about 15 minutes in so that you get your full dose. If you're grazing, you just have it with you at the table, plan to take it throughout the meal. If you have, when you have second helpings, when you have dessert, you know, and, and that goes for everyday um, eating too. You know, if you have a second helping or if you have dessert or you have some cookies after dinner or something like that, take it again. You know, you want it present with the food that you're eating so it can be the most effective. And then maybe you budget some non-fat snacks after dinner, <laughs> you know? Something to think about as a way to, to cut back on it, especially if you're tired of pill after pill after pill, right? So when we need a break from taking crayon, it's okay to, to, to plan for these non-fat snacks so that you don't have to take it. You know, it gives you a break and that's fine. And that's why I recommended that Boost um, Soothe Shake is because it's fat free. You know, so it can just be one more thing that you don't have to take Creon with. Especially for those that are struggling with insurance coverage issues or have really, really high co-pays with the Creon. Um, you may want to think about that too. You know, budgeting non-fat snacks so that you can save your, your prescription. Yeah. I have a question. Is there a test that a dietitian um, orders in order to determine the level of creon to administer a patient? Thank you for that. Um, there, there is not a test um, that can be ordered to determine how much you need. You know, we really go based on estimates and research. You know, so really we go based on sim signs and symptoms once you're started on it to see if it's a, it's working for you. So if you start taking it and it um, stops the diarrhea, the gas, the bloating, the oily stools, then it's working for you and you're likely at your right dose. If you start taking it and you keep having those signs and symptoms, then you're not at your right dose. You know, especially if you're eating a lot and you're still losing weight. 
you know, those can be signs and symptoms. There is the pancreatic fecal elastase test, but we don't, um, we don't commonly use it for our patients that are being treated with octreotide and lanreotide because we know that fat malabsorption is very common, and if someone is being treated with one of those drugs and they come in with those symptoms, we just start them on the medication. And I don't think there's any harm in doing a trial of enzymes, whether it's Creon, Zenpep, any of the brands, and just see if you feel better on it. You know, I think that's that can be very appropriate too. You mentioned copays. Um, yeah. One thing that we did see is on their the manufacturer, the drug manufacturer's website, they have a patient assistance program, and there's also lots of educational materials. In fact, Dr. Mazizadeh has a video on that website. Okay. If you divide your meals in, for instance, uh, eight meals a day or mm-hmm. whatever, ten, you need to take at least one creon per meal. Okay. Every time that you are eating, you need a creon. Unless you're eating something that's fat-free, right? Let's say you eat, you eat an apple, you don't have to take it. No, no, but, no, no. But if but you in general, divide your breakfast in two, mm-hmm. that breakfast, uh, uh, lunch, dinner, yes. you know, every you time you at eat, least one creon. Every time you eat something that has fat, you have to take it. Yeah. You know, some people may find that they have something that has just a tiny bit of fat, less than five grams. Maybe they can get away with not taking it and they don't have signs and symptoms. But ideally, <coughs> you want to absorb all of the fat that you're eating. And if you've been prescribed it, I would suggest taking it every time you eat, even if it's several small meals per day, every time you eat. And yes, at least one, sometimes two. Yeah, just considering. <coughs> Question, who do you connect with most in the team, the, the gastroenterologist or the oncologist, or is there a oh. particular person? So um, so I work with directly with our, our medical oncologists here as well as our radiation oncologists. Um, our gastroenterologists are not located here in the cancer center. Um, they're in different areas. So I work directly with Dr. Hennefar. Can you speak to um, collagen powder, which seems to be the new awesome thing to (laughs) heal your gut? Sure. Um, So uh, many of you may have seen collagen powder sold in some of the health food stores or online. Um, You know, there's not a lot of research to support its use, um, either as a a protein shake or as a supplement that's particularly good for skin, hair, and nails. Uh, It's not going to hurt you to use collagen powder, um, but I wouldn't treat it as a protein supplement because it's not going to contain all of the essential amino acids in it. Um, So when we look for different powders for protein supplements, look for whey or soy um, protein powders because those are complete proteins. Uh, You know, when we get into the the plant-based protein powders, they're going to be incomplete proteins. And so it's not always the best um, way to supplement your protein intake if you're just using, let's say, hemp protein, for example, which is an incomplete protein. You know, same for the collagen, not a complete protein, not necessarily going to harm you, but... If you want to prioritize what your needs are, I would I would focus on actual whey protein isolate powder over collagen. Oh, sure. If you're taking collagen powder to help with the hair, nail, and skin aspect, um, you can't actually put collagen back into those those areas of the body, the hair, skin, and nails. It's it's something that has to be stimulated um, internally. To, to reproduce, not you can't physically put collagen back into your skin or your hair or your nails. <laughs> so, what do you think about the insure powders? Are they any good? Uh, which insure, powder? insure powder, like the chocolate and vanilla, the powder instead of oh, the powder instead of the ready made yeah. to drink. Oh, um, I think they're adequate. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's more portable, especially for traveling, if you could add something to it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's great to start with a base, you know, whether it's intra powder and if you, you know, another thing to consider is if you are getting out the blender and everything, you're going to make a smoothie, you could put protein powder, you can choose whatever fruits you're tolerating, uh, any nuts, nut butter, things like that, and make your own shake, put a handful of spinach in it, you know, things like that, and get some um, some great phytonutrients as well something to consider um, I've heard so much that that n- the supplements just do not absorb you know you pee out pretty much all the benefits of most of the vitamins that you take 
Um, and I know that's been in a lot of medical journals and things like mm-hmm. that. I was just curious what, if there are some, you mentioned a few, but yeah. are there some that you don't have that issue with that you actually do absorb those supplements? It just really depends on what it is, you know, for a multivitamin and mineral supplement, for example, I think sometimes you do benefit from it if you are struggling with malabsorption and everything is running, you're digesting everything very quickly, everything you eat, you feel like is running through you. You know, I think it does make sense to take a multivitamin even in that case, because you're trying to catch up to your needs. Um, You know, that said, I don't usually recommend them unless there's an indication like that. And really just focusing on what you need, what the research supports that you take. Um, And also keep in mind that sometimes dietary supplements can interfere with medications. Um, They can actually cause harm. So not all dietary supplements are safe to take. It really just depends on what they are, what medications you're taking, and what other nutrients you're taking too, and what your current state is. You know, so there's a lot of um, research out there on different ones, and it's just very individual. You know, we have a great database for looking things up like that to see if there are drug nutrient interactions. Um, But I don't suggest taking anything unless you have a good reason to take it. So if your vitamin D is low, yes, you should take vitamin D and bring your level up. But if you don't know if your vitamin D is low or not, I wouldn't suggest starting to take lots of vitamin D because it could go up too high because you don't know your starting point, right? Do you guys monitor blood levels and micronutrients? We, um... We tend to use um, complete metabolic panels, so it's not all micronutrients. We really test if there's a, a concern for deficiency. So if there's a concern for vitamin D deficiency, we could check that particular lab. Um, and then, you know, as I said earlier with the zinc, the, the serum test isn't that accurate. So yes, we can check your serum zinc, but it doesn't mean that's a good indicator of your zinc status. So again, it really, it depends on what it is and what the the concern is for. You know, if there's a concern for fat soluble vitamin deficiency, we can test those labs. What about the vitamin B complex separately from um, being in the multi? Separately? So taking a B complex and a multivitamin? Yeah, my question. Yeah. Is it helthful? I mean, most multivitamins are at least 100% of your daily value for each nutrient. So you're just doubling up and then whatever the B vitamins you're getting from your diet. To to me, unless there's a a real concern for a particular deficiency, I think it's too much. I think it's too much. I think it, yeah. Um, You mentioned traveling. I mean, yeah, you mentioned traveling earlier, just a second ago, and I was wondering if you could speak to maybe eating out and what tips and tricks you might have and advice. Sure. Um, Well, you know, if it depends on what your issues are, you know, if you're struggling with diarrhea, I really try to put up a lot of slides that outline low fiber food choices. So what to look for, what to ask for. So looking if, if you're following a low fiber diet, looking for those cooked vegetables. And, you know, I think it's it's pretty easy to find refined grains like breads and pastas and things like that. But, you know, going for those leaner protein choices, maybe asking for lower fat options, baked, not fried, um, poached, you know, not sauteed, things like that. And really kind of know what to ask for, what to look for on the menu, just to see how things are prepared. And yes, you can always ask for modifications when you go to restaurants. See if you can get the dressing on the side. See if you can have something cooked that's normally raw. You know, I I find that many restaurants are accommodating in that way and they can work with you, especially if you know what to look out for. So if you know you need to be on low fat and you know you need to have cooked vegetables, look for that, ask for that. You know, see if someone will steam something for you rather than sauteing it. I think it's an appropriate request. And I know people tend to eat the same things week after week. (laughs) So, you know, finding the restaurants that you like and knowing where to go and then get the same thing when you go, it's okay. Most of us do that anyway. You know, we tend to order the same things. Do you have a position or opinion on CBD or THC? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's that's a great question. It's something we're certainly learning more and more about. Um, You know, for an appetite stimulant, we do have a lot of patients that use THC and CBD to see if it serves them in that way. Um, For some people, it works well, and for others, it doesn't work at all. So it really, it depends on the person. Um, currently, I would suggest using edible forms of those things if experimenting with that as an appetite stimulant rather than using 
a vaporizer or something like that that's been in the news a lot lately about some of the potential hazardous effects of vaping, right? Um, so considering that and seeing if it has an effect for you. Um, I know a lot of people like to use CBD and with the thought that it may treat their disease. And I don't find that the research really supports that in that way, although some people do like to use CBD for anxiety or for pain or for other things too. And I think that's okay, yeah. What if a symptom is not diarrhea or uh, constipation, uh -huh. but um, like a heavy, a big stool? Like, uh, is that a sign of malabsorption? If you have a, you eat and you normally have a, like a big uh, stool, meaning mm -hmm. a lot of it goes out. Yeah. Um, it's it's not a s necessarily a, a classic sign of fat malabsorption. Normally, it's it's oil, it's stool color, so orange, yellow, um, so the color is off. But uh, if you feel that something's not right, then you know maybe that's something you want to explore, especially if you've had a pancreatic resection or been treated with octreotide or lanreotide, because fat malabsorption is common for those things. Yeah. But no, it's not a, it's not a classic um, sign or symptom of fat malabsorption. But again, you know, if you feel like that might be what's going on in your body, ask your doctor if he'll do it, if he or she will do a trial of enzymes. Can I try this? See if it makes a difference. If it does, yes, great. If not, then you know, consider other options. Is there um, a website or an area that we can um, research dietitians that are knowledgeable in net because you can go to a dietitian and like sometimes other doctors you look at them and they you end up knowing more than they do sometimes so right. is there um, an area that we can research a dietitian that's knowledgeable in net that's a great question other than yourself <laughs> right right um, that's a great question thank you um, I'm not familiar with a database specifically for that. Um, I will say that a dietitian working um, with a um, small bowel and digestive program is likely going to ha have knowledge of that. But I would also look for a dietitian with a CSO credential after their name. So that's a certified specialist in oncology nutrition uh, as a starting off point. You know, I know if you go to the um, uh, eatright.org. You can search for a dietitian there and look for people in your area with that credential. Um, but I would suggest working with someone that, that works with oncology patients and specifically with, with NET if possible. Um, do y'all, are y'all familiar of it, uh, with anything? Usually we go through the NET cancer centers and ask them if they have one. Um, mm -hmm. and that's often our starting point. It's kind of varied. <laughs> Right. I mean, and, and ask, the go ahead. Nutritionist that worked with Dr. Liu that has a mm -hmm. private practice now and sees okay. patients, I think, via phone and networking or, you know, Skype. Yeah. Um, and I think she's pretty flexible with her rates. We can probably ask Dr. Liu okay. for her contact information. Okay. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. And if, you know, ask your, always ask your oncologist. Can I speak with a dietitian? Can you refer me to somebody? Um, and, and that's a good starting point too. And then if your dietitian isn't that familiar, you know, make them learn, you know, push them to, to look more into it too. You know, especially if you're not getting your questions asked, maybe s let them have the time that they need to look into it more and get back with you too. I mean, I don't, I don't know that there's any one right way to go about this because we're so limited, right? Um, and also a few years back at our last annual conference that was hosted here at Cedars. Um, our speaker, one of our speakers was Leanne Burns, who is a dietitian out of New Orleans, and I believe she's private as well, so. Yeah, yeah. especially for the, the telemedicine, online resources, that could be a, a really great way to stay connected. Yeah. yeah. Just a reminder that the um, recipe books are in the back, thanks to um, Healing Kitchens, who has donated those. Um, and there's one for people who have carcinoid syndrome, and one for people who don't. To that end, um, just a reminder that when you go see your physicians, one thing we can do, one of our objectives is awareness. And you can pick up some of the Lachnitz flyers, which is in the back, 
there and let them know about LACNAS. This is something that is important to you and a resource for the community, for other patients. Um, and there's also a physician primer in the back that's created by HealingNet. They just created their second edition. It's downloadable on their website. There's some hard copies and we can get more. You can bring that to your physicians. This is especially not it's not for the net experts, it's for the community physicians, right? The ones that we've gone to, or, um, whether the physicians, nurses, who, when you mention NET, they're like, what, what? what's that? <laughs> so it's for them to increase awareness in the community so that it'll help for other people who might have NET for earlier, um, that they can diagnose it earlier and help other people earlier. The other thing Healing Net is doing that I'm just going to mention to you is called the healing net tapestry program and there's some cards here it's something you can um, do on the website they're trying to get a compilation of patient and physician and um, stories from everyone in this community whether it's physicians nurses dietitians patients caregivers um, answering a few questions just about what your experience has been like what are some challenges um, that you've experienced, what's given you inspiration, and what have you learned that needs to be shared. They're creating this tapestry of different um, words or videos that they're gonna release on Net Cancer Day in November. So if you wanna contribute to that, even a short clip, a few words, um, it's, there's some cards in the back, um, and actually it's to be submitted online, not to us um, through the Healing Net Foundation. And the other resource that is available, NetRF, the Net Research Foundation, which is um, a huge foundation that uh, um, supports a lot of net cancer research, they just released a podcast. And the podcast features a lot of the net experts and, their, and, and patients and their voices. And so the first episode is available online as well. And all this information will be available online. We'll have the um, slides and the YouTube video up and you'll be able to see this excellent, very helpful, thorough information. Um, just a reminder too, if you're seeing um, net experts, this is uh, the net vitals is something that Giovanna and myself, and uh, along with the support and help of Dr. Dan Lee created for patients to help enhance their communication with physicians. So especially when you're gathering your information and going to see a net expert as a second or third or fourth opinion, um, going through this, it's downloadable, um, and fillable online uh, on our website, lacnets.org, backslash net vitals. Um, so you can go online, you can go through it yourself. It's not necessarily um, for the endpoint of trying to know it all, but at least identifying where the gaps are that you still have an questions that need to be answered. And as you're going through, it helps you to learn, oh, what medication am I on? What um, what's my pathology show? What is a KI-67? If you don't know, you can go look it up. We have links to resources. There's a, a video, a webinar that g helps you go through, go through and fill it out yourself. So especially for people who are newly diagnosed or maybe have kind of not really um, been in the loop for a while and just kind of get back, getting back into re-educating yourself, this is a really great uh, way to, to um, to prepare for your uh, appointment and it helps that appointment be more efficient as well. And then after you fill it out, we're not collecting the information, it's for you. After you fill it out, you bring it to your appointment, you can show your doctor, it's all on six pages. Um, and it's all the relevant information for a net expert or about net, about this specifically. So all the key pieces of information um, whittled down to six pages. So instead of bringing in your you know, suitcase or your, your rolling file folder or your big um, folder that you know, it's no way, it's, it's really difficult for them to get through in a 45 minute appointment. At least you've consolidated it to six pages. And then instead of spending the appointment defining things like, oh, okay, I-67 or what's differentiation, you might, you might already have answered some of those questions. And then you could spend more time with the doctor talking about important, the more important things. You can move further along and talk about treatment and talk about other options. So thank you very much for everything and all yeah, your time, Kenzie. Thank you.